In spite of the fact that Google seems to think that I am a professional YouTuber, I do actually spend most of my time as a full-time PhD candidate at MIT. But if you'd asked me 10 years ago whether I'd be doing research in machine learning and neuroscience, the answer would have almost definitely been no. So today I want to tell you a little bit about how I became a researcher and all of the experiences that led me to where I am today. If you're new here, I'm Jordan and consider subscribing if you want to hear more about my life as a PhD student or stay up to date with recent news in AI and emerging technologies. And if you want to catch up with me outside of YouTube, you can follow me on Instagram where I do a weekly Q&A every Wednesday. All right, so there are a lot of ways that you can get into research. My journey started when I was, I believe, a sophomore in high school through a program called the Weston Science Scholars Program. This program was a program that was run by my high school, and it was a program that let us do research at a local university under a professor and present our results after three months of work over the summer. Now, the research project that I got put on was actually in environmental engineering. We were looking at how wastewater runoff affects the biome of local lakes, and it had turned out that I think it was actually someone's master's project or something, so the professor we were working with already knew what the outcome was going to be. But it was my first introduction to what research is like, what it's like to collect your own data, analyze your samples, and present that work to the public. We also got guest speakers, which was really cool. I actually learned about astrophysics for the first time when I was in that program, and for a while I wanted to do research in astrophysics. And it was a great first step, I think, for me as someone who was definitely interested in science and engineering growing up as well as medicine, but wasn't really sure what the options for people who didn't necessarily want like a standard nine to five were. My next research experience was when I was a senior in high school through the summer before I went to college. And that was actually an opportunity that I got at Columbia in New York. I got to work for Dr. Helen Liu in the Biomaterials and Interface Tissue Engineering Lab, which was a great, after school activity to get me into what doing science on a day to day like was like and also have me working with a grad student so I could get a sense of what being a graduate student was like. Now interestingly when I met with Dr. Liu for the first time she asked me whether I was interested in research and I told her no. I was interested in experiments because I was like 16 and had no idea what I was talking about and she still let me work in her lab which uh, is a huge credit to her because clearly I was not fully qualified to be there in the first place, but it was a great experience. I was there for, I believe about eight months after school. My high school also had a program called Senior Option where if you'd already completed all your graduation requirements, you could just go and do an approved activity for the last two months of senior year. So I did research full time during that period and then for another month after I graduated. And that was a great way to see what it's like to do research that, well, First of all, research that someone else hadn't already done. Um, and then second of all, to see what it's like to do research in a lab, to see what it's like to be a graduate student, and to see what it's like to actually contribute to a field of science. I worked on essentially developing biomaterials for the periodontal ligament, so the ligament that keeps your teeth in your mouth. And we were interested in essentially making materials that could be used to deliver drugs to people who had diseases of the gums in order to target treatment towards those areas without it spreading everywhere else and potentially harming the rest of their bodies. So in addition to being a science nerd, I was also an eight season varsity athlete in high school. So I collected my fair share of injuries over the years. I actually have a partially herniated disc in my lower back and also just have like various weird knee issues. And so when I was looking into sports injuries, I actually got really interested in herniated discs and tissue engineering for intervertebral disc repair. And that led me to my third research experience, which was when I was an undergrad at Cornell. I worked in the Benasser and Estroff labs for three years, so I joined at the end of my freshman year. And I was working on tissue engineering the meniscus, which is a crescent-shaped structure that's in your knee. It's a load-bearing structure. If you had friends who played sports in high school and college or you played sports in high school and college, you probably know someone who tore it. And it's something that's a little bit hard to repair because it forms essentially based on the geometry of your bones as you learn to walk. So everyone's meniscus is unique. 
Luckily, the lab that I was working in had essentially a 3D printer that prints living cells. And so I got to work on designing these menisci and then creating the ligament that attaches them to your bone to make sure that they are structurally sound. This was a great experience for me. This is probably my first long-term independent research project, given that I was in the lab for three years. And I actually ended up publishing two papers with the graduate students that I was working with after I graduated from Cornell, which was also a great experience in terms of building my resume. But I think the biggest thing that I got out of it in terms of my research journey was realizing how much failure is involved in research. So for this project that I was on for about three years, nothing I did really worked until probably the third year. So it was an exercise in learning how to take results that don't necessarily show what you want them to and generate new hypotheses, come up with new research ideas, and have fun on a day-to-day -day basis while doing it. I also learned a ton of different skills in the process. So I learned cell culture, I learned how to do materials testing, I learned a lot about biomineralization, I learned a lot about bone biomechanics. I actually ended up pivoting my interest from doing more cell-related stuff to doing more computational stuff uh, about halfway through my project, and my advisor and the graduate students that I worked with were kind enough to let me take a pretty hard pivot. And so I also developed my coding skills and my medical image analysis skills in the process, and then got to work with a bunch of cool medical imaging machinery. So I got to work with MRIs and micro CTs through Cornell's facilities. Having said that, even though I'd had all this research experience even before I went to college, I had actually thought that I was going to work in pharma after I graduated from college and not go to grad school at all. And so to kind of test that out, I ended up doing a summer internship at Novartis after my sophomore year in college. I worked for their clinical translational imaging group and was essentially analyzing a bunch of clinical trial and preclinical data. And it was a great experience in that I think it taught me a lot about the workflow of pharma companies, what it's like to be an entry-level employee at a pharma company, and it also taught me that that wasn't necessarily a job that I really wanted. So it was a great learning experience in terms of realizing that research is actually probably the thing that I was most interested in doing, and continuing down that path would probably be the thing that made the most sense. To further test that theory, I then did a summer research program at Stanford through the Amgen Scholars Program after my junior year. Uh, when I was there, I was working with researchers at Stanford Medicine on using machine learning on medical imaging. Now, this was an interesting summer for me because in the past, especially when I was working at Cornell, I picked up a lot of skills on the fly based on whatever experiment or analysis I was interested in doing. But I hadn't actually started dabbling in machine learning until I got put on a project for it, which I learned that I would be doing about two weeks before I had to fly out to California. So I had to learn at least the basics of machine learning by the time that I got there. I have a whole video on the resources that I used to do that. I'll leave it in the description and add a card or whatever up here. Um, but in short, I was able to at least get a basic footing for how machine learning worked and how I might be using it before I got to campus. It definitely helped that I already had a background in computer science and programming. I'd been pursuing a computer science minor at the time, so it wasn't too much of a leap, but it was definitely a stress test of my ability to learn as well as my existing skills. The combination of that project and taking upper-level coursework in biomedical engineering that focused more on electrical engineering devices and wearables actually got me interested in leaving the tissue engineering, the orthopedic tissue engineering field when I went to grad school. And so that's actually how I ended up applying to the program that I'm in now, uh, the Harvard MIT Health Sciences and Technology program. It also helped me realize that I didn't want to be pre-med, so I came into college thinking that I was going to do an MD, PhD, and was pre-med for the first probably two years or so. Um, and I think the combination of Realizing that my research interests had kind of changed towards something that wasn't quite as closely tied to the clinic, as well as taking organic chemistry and for context, I did not get diagnosed with ADHD until grad school, so I didn't know I had it at the time. But taking organic chemistry and realizing that if I had to take a bunch of classes that were this abstract and confusing and difficult to interact with in a, a physical or visual way, then I was definitely not going to make it through med school. So I dropped my pre-med affiliation, but HST 
still has us take med school courses with the med students. So I got that tie to the clinic, which I really love, while still getting to focus more on research that actually interests me. So on to my sixth research experience, I guess research experiences. The way that my program works is that we get to do rotations for the first now six months when I was there, it was a year. And rotations are where you get to basically try out being in a lab for a specified period of time. It's a great opportunity to essentially try something before you actually commit to it, which I always recommend to people who are interested in getting into research because you don't actually know if you're going to like it on a day-to-day -day basis, even if it sounds cool on paper. And I actually did my first rotation in a lab that focused on privacy preserving machine learning. So for that rotation project, I was looking at split neural networks and was trying to basically figure out whether you could encrypt health data in a way that preserved relevant clinical features while still preserving the privacy and conforming to HIPAA regulations. The patients could send off images to be analyzed or send them to their doctors without having to worry about any sort of privacy concerns. That was a really interesting project for me. It was probably the most theory-based machine learning that I'd done in a while and also just like cryptography because I was getting into encryption. And it also taught me that I didn't want to code all day. I didn't want to have a project that was exclusively coding. So I ended up on my seventh research experience, which is essentially my thesis work for my PhD, moving towards something where I could split my time between doing coding and computational modeling work on my computer, as well as doing animal work in the lab. Importantly, I did not come into my PhD planning on doing neuroscience at all. I actually was more interested in developing certain sets of skills. I was interested in having a relationship with my advisor that would be useful for any future goals I had, which do not and did not include continuing in academia. And I wanted to find a project that let me essentially do all of those things, but I didn't necessarily care what the project was. Luckily, I came across actually two different advisors who ended up being really good fits for me in terms of mentors and ended up having a joint project that ended up being really interesting to me, which hopefully I'll be able to talk more about towards the end of this year. COVID has thrown off all the timelines. So the work that I was working on, the work that I have been working on has been slowed down, unfortunately, but we're still trucking along. And it has been, I think, a really good fit for me and has definitely helped me grow a ton as a researcher, especially someone who moved into a new field that I didn't really have any expertise with because it, again, forced me to learn a lot of stuff on the fly and develop a lot more independence and develop my own hypotheses for this much larger research project that I have that is, you know, more complex and spans more fields than any of the research projects that I did in the past. So that's been my path so far to becoming a machine learning and neuroscience researcher. Obviously, not everyone's path will look like mine, but I think that mine is kind of a nice example of how you can start in one place and end up somewhere entirely unrelated, as well as that you don't necessarily need to come into, especially if you're interested in getting into a field like machine learning, you don't necessarily have to come from the traditional pure computer science route. You can come at it from a bunch of different areas that overlap. And while I'm not necessarily planning on staying in this field after my PhD, it has been a great opportunity to learn a ton of skills that I just wouldn't be able to learn anywhere else from people who are only at places like MIT and Harvard, and has also been a great opportunity to grow my professional presence by networking, publishing, going to conferences, and being able to show people all of that stuff on places like my website. So if you're in the market to upgrade your professional presence online, I would highly recommend checking out Hover, who are kindly sponsoring today's video. Hover makes it easy to buy all kinds of cool domains, whether you're looking to upgrade your personal website or build an online portfolio. Hover also has over 400 domain extensions, so if you're not satisfied with the .com domain, you can get some fun extensions like .nyc or .fun. I was able to snag jordanharrod.com a few years ago, and it's always really nice Nice to know that even as I change my website over time, people will always be able to find me via the same link on the internet. Even if you don't need a website, you can use Hover to set up a custom email account, and the entire process is super streamlined, making it easy for you to purchase a new domain whenever you need one. So whether you're planning to build an online portfolio or just want a cool custom email address, head over to hover.com slash jordanharrow to save 10% on your new domain. Again, if you want to check out my video on the resources that I use to get into machine learning, I will leave a 
thingy up here. You can follow me on my various socials down here, and I will see you all next week. Bye.